So I'll stop for the session, so I'll try and keep it snappy. So uh, probably going to go back a, a few talks to where I'm going to be sort of basing my stuff on. So what we've been trying to do at IPSL is take a, a systematic approach in a perfect model framework to pull apart the processes contributing to the PDO. We're actually, in a broader sense, specific decadal variability, but this talk's going to focus more on the PDO at this stage, which is what we've been looking at. Uh, this does the job. Well, there you go. So in a broader context, uh, specific decadal variability can really mani manifest itself in two regions. You can have tropical decadal variability, where you have low frequency variability in the tropics, kind of similar to what Ricardo was talking about earlier, or EDV. Um, as we've heard from Matt earlier, you can have uh, your low frequency variability over the North Pacific, or often referred to as the, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or the basin-wide signature, the IPO. Um, with obviously the PDO, which is what I'm going to talk about, focus more on my talk on here, um, pertaining to the leading EOF of the monthly SST anomaly. So this is basically what Matt was talking about earlier this morning. Um, Matt left off with this figure, which was the, where I kind of want to start off, because this has been a little bit of a, a nice little model that we wanted to tease out as far as the processes contributing to the, to the PDO. So you can see from the figure, we have the El Nino influencing the Aleutian low through the atmospheric bridge, that then has an impact on the PDO as my mechanism. You also have internal stochastic variability within the mid-latitude atmosphere, which has an impact also on the PDO. Um, then you also have the Rosby wave potentially feeding back on the PDO and the re-emergence mechanism. I, Matt sort of went into detail on all of these earlier this morning, so I won't, won't go into them too much. So, wait, what's the slide? So I guess, and as Ricardo was pointing out, your low frequency modulation in both regions can, be, can come from a combination of both local processes and remote forcing. So what we're trying to aim to do at the moment, and then the, what I'm going to present today, is to determine how much of this low frequency variability that we see in the extra tropics, or the PDO, can be attributed to, to tropical forcing. So how much of this is coming from the tropics at this stage? Um, as a, a follow-on that we're planning to do, we also want to, to look into how much of this uh, extra tropical variability in the North Pacific is potentially having a, a, an impact on low frequency variability in the tropics. But this is sort of a second stage of the project. I should outline at the start, this is what I'm presenting is largely a work in progress as well. So, um, and obviously, like anything, one of the limitations with studying uh, decadal variability is the short observational record, which makes it really hard to really pull out and understand the interplay between these processes. Um, so one thing that's been a nice development in recent years is the, uh, uh, the efficiency of coupled global climate models. So now uh, we can do these multi-centennial integrations with relatively little, in, uh, relatively, li relatively little computational expense. So they're quite, they provide an in invaluable tool to be able to to really understand potentially what the physical processes are that are contributing on decadal, multi-decadal, and even centennial timescales. Um, so that's this, the essence of what we're doing here. Um, and so what we're aiming to do with the model is similar to what other people have been doing previously, doing a system of partial coupling, partial forcing experiments where we force regions to shut off certain processes um, pertaining to the, the PDO, so isolating the processes to highlight what, we, what it is we want to see, or their relative contribution, as my slide points out. Um, so what the model that I'm using here is the uh, IPSL CGCM, the fully coupled CGCM. Um, I'm using the latest version, which is being developed for the new CMIP incarnation. Um, so it's IPSL CM6 beta VLR. It's a, it's a low resolution model. Um, it's essentially the same physics as the 5A, so for people that want to pull apart intermodal differences, it's, uh, it, it follows those lines. Uh, the added benefit that we have at the moment is it's gone from being able to simulate six years in one day to 40 years in one day. So it's actually very, very efficient um, for, for its flaws. It's, uh, it's a, it provides a really nice tool to be able to do long integrations. Um, so all simulations that I'm going to be showing today, or the result of the simulation, comes from a pre-industrial control forcing. So at this stage, all we're interested is the internal, uh, in, yeah, the, the internal variability of the model. 
Um, there's no external forcing, so we're not considering external forcing. And we're working in a perfect model framework, so we're working to the model's own climatology, and we're not trying to recreate historical periods or 20th century records or any of this sort of stuff. We're purely looking at the processes inherent within the model. Um, so we allow the model to spin up for 50 years. It seems to be to, uh, to get rid of that initial drift. And then we focus on a 250-year period, or what I'm going to present today is concerning a 250-year period. One thing that needs to be reassessed, and I'll show a caveat at the end, is that uh, at present the climatology that I'll be showing in the next few slides is based on a period that's actually 200 to 1,200 year in the model simulation, which this needs to be some, this needs some amendment. But I'll, I'll go into that as we go through. Um, so just to give a, a, a broad scope idea on how the model um, performs to begin with in the fully coupled uh, simulation. So this, on the left-hand side, you have the Hattis. This is the, the figure that we've seen continually for the period 1901 to 2010, just your, your first EOF uh, re regressed onto C the regression between SST onto your, your first EOF of North Pacific. Um, then on the right-hand side, we have basically the equivalent plot for the, the period, uh, the 250-year period for the IPSO CM6 model. Um, I mean, one obvious thing that we can see there is it has slight, uh, slightly stronger variability in the North Pacific. Um, the weaker pole is, is also, the maximum PDO cooling is also slight, shifted slightly west in the simulation. Um, but overall, as far as the patterns and the variance explain, it's not doing too bad of a job. It, it seems like a, it's a, it, looking at that, it seems like a realistic tool to potentially be using. So the next question that came up from supervisors as well was how does the teleconnection patterns look in the model? So if we look here, this is uh, monthly stratified but seasonal values. So we start off with DJF at the top. On the left-hand side, we have the NCEPS SLP regressed onto the uh, HAD ISST. And as you go down, you see the maximum, t uh, the maximum teleconnection occurring in DJF and then slowly uh, reducing as you come into March, April, May. Um, one thing with the model is it seems that the peak in this, in this teleconnection pattern occurs more towards probably uh, in JFM, so late March. Um, so there is a slight delay in the teleconnection pattern compared to the observations. But there's still a, re there's still a reasonably strong teleconnection there during the winter season. Um, and so why might this be? It would be the obvious question. Why is it that you have a delayed teleconnection pattern? Well, it can be attributed to the seasonality of ENSO in the model is the main factor. I mean, so at the top there, we have uh, the seasonal breakdown of uh, the, and the ENSO, so the tropical EOF1 regressed onto SST. So you can see a peak sort of SON, DJF, which we all know. Um, with the model, this peak tends to occur more towards the springtime which is one, of, this is one of the caveats of the model, that it's, uh, the seasonal phase locking is a little off. But insofar as looking at the teleconnection patterns um, through DEJF to MAM, there is still a reasonably strong tropical signal during, this, during the winter season. It, it appears more that the model has quite a strong tropical signal throughout the year rather than it just being isolated to, to DJF. Um, and as Matt pointed out this morning, this signal has definitely shifted to the west as well. So. Um, so even though the ENSO peaks in MAM, there's, there's still a reasonably strong tropical signature in SST during the DJF, so we'll, we'll, we'll press on. I mean, one thing that could be considered in all this is, as Tom mentioned yesterday as well, is some sort of artificial um, adjustment to correct the seasonality in, in the simulation before doing PDO simulations. Okay, so what basically I'm going to show today as a first part of a series of experiments that we're conducting. So we, the first thing we wanted to do was, was we we're hoping to look at what's the influence of the tropical Pacific Ocean on the PDO. So what we do is we take the model's own climatology, climatology in the tropical Pacific. So you can sort of see the, the oh, going back forward there. Um, and what we do is we want to constrain the, the, the SST variability in the tropics, essentially to kill your, uh, kill your ENSO in the tropics. Um, so that we can determine the relative influence. Basically, we want to see this part of the puzzle. So if we kill our ENSO, how much are we killing that teleconnection in the atmospheric bridge to, to the Aleutian low, which is then potentially going on to the, the PDO. And the way that we do this is we nudge the tropical SSTs towards, like I say, the climatology through the heat flux term. So we, uh, 
as you can see there, you have your SST, you subtract your climatological SST, and then you have a little restoring coefficient as well um, because the ocean's not seeing the atmosphere. No, the atmosphere's not seeing the ocean. Um, so, yeah, that's just as an outline of the, the first set of experiments that we were, we, we were sort of conducting here. So, to go on. So, effectively, what we have here on the top is we have a zonal section through the tropics, two degrees south to two degrees north, in the fully coupled simulation. So this, these are both for the same time period in the simulation as well. The second one is the one where we nudge towards our climatological SST, so if effectively killing your ENSO. And this is apparent. This is, so this is your, your, SST, uh, your temperature variability with depth, and so you can basically see you're killing your thermocline response, uh, especially in the western tropical Pacific. And if you, look at the, if you do the difference plot, you can see there that you're effectively killing your ENSO in the upper layer. So if we then go back to a similar plot to what I showed before, so on the left we have our, our, um, our PDO index regressed onto SST. And then on the right we have the same period, but with our nudging of the SST in the tropics. So basically we've, and so what you can see here is effectively we've killed our ENSO in the model. Um, you've also killed, reduced a large percentage of 40% of your, your PDO signal in the extra tropics. Um, so by killing your ENSO, you've uh, it's significantly reduced it. Um, another feature of it is you can see that you sort of lose that interhemispheric uh, IPO pattern. So there's less of, a, less of a pattern appearing now in the southern hemisphere. There's also a reduced variability in SST in the Indian Ocean. But it doesn't seem to be that much of an impact in the Atlantic from killing the ENSO. So um, that was all about that. And so this is, like I said earlier, there's a little bit of a caveat as to um, the climatology being used as well, which is something that I'll adjust when I, when I go back to the lab. Um, what we have here is we have the fully coupled simulation. This is just the mean fields, the mean SST fields along the equatorial, uh, along the the equatorial Pacific, the nudged fields. So there is very, very, a very, very small change in the mean state. So you're getting a change in the variability associated with killing the ENSO, but your mean state doesn't show a large shift. But if you look at the difference plot, there is some sort of uh, difference there at the bottom of the mixed layer. And what we're, that could be a result of uh, using a climatology that's not directly uh, over the period that we're concerning ourselves with. So this is the... the the first in a, a series of uh, systematic studies that we're hoping to, to complete over the next couple of months. Um, so just basically just at the moment, so the present conclusions that we have from this work is the IPSL um, reproduces the, IP the IPO variability reasonably well. This is despite the fact that there's a, a seasonal shift in the teleconnection patterns. Um, so we've set up some sensitivity ex experiments to explore this interaction between the tropics and the extratropics using a perfect model framework. Um, and ENSO appears to contribute to about 40% of the SST variability that we're observing in the PDO, in the, more in the western pole. But it seems that it has less of an influence over that eastern pole. Um, and uh, so, and it also appears that constraining the tropical variability also produces only a slight change in the tropical mean state. So at the moment, we're sort of going up. Oh, one more point, of course. and. Uh, so, uh, so the potential influence of mid-latitude variability on ENSO is also the, uh, the focus of exper future experiments that we're planning on conducting. So at the moment, we're currently going on to, to, uh, to do a series of um, forced, forced experiments where we're forcing the, uh, the extra tropics with prescribed teleconnection patterns associated with ENSO through the, through the heat flux terms, the fresh water flux, and the, and the momentum fluxes. And again, this is something that is we're just currently working on. So um, if anyone has any ideas or if anyone wants to discuss potentially what this could mean, then come see me and we'll have a chat. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Keep it sharp.